Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Brad Karp. Uh, he's an old friend of mine, and many of you know him. He has done a bunch of work on many different things. He's I guess the most famous work that he has done was uh, geographical routing. Uh, now he has ventured into other areas. One of this is this is JavaScript security work. Um, it's got a lot of traction. People in Google and Firefox, as you can see, are interested. And um, he's going to talk about that today. Yeah. Thanks, Chichu. Um Well, thank you all for coming. And thank you to uh, whoever's out there watching online uh, for coming. Uh, as Chichu says, I'm Brad Karp, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, privacy for web applications today. And I'm going to mostly talk to you about it. Privacy is a huge problem, and there are many, many layers of uh, the sort of software and hardware stack for the typical browser user. So I'm not going to be talking about something that is comprehensive about all the layers of the stack. For example, I will not be telling you what to do about bad USB today, even though while you're using a browser, bad USB could own you. I'm going to be focusing on the web architecture and the browser architecture and JavaScript in particular today. Uh, so, what is this thing they call the web? Um, well, uh, it used to be in the good old days that the web was just a way of putting documents online. And if you really wanted to get fancy, maybe you'd have some links to a few things. Um, it was hypertext. It was very cool. Um, and uh, one of the things I find amusing personally is that some of the most hardcore kernel hacker kind of people you can think of in the systems area have the most basic web pages possible. There's almost an inverse correlation, not to pick on anybody in particular. Um, so the web has evolved from being just simple pages of static content to sort of pretty complicated and featureful applications that we sort of rely on on a daily basis. And so, of course, as you all well know, Web pages contain JavaScript code, and when you visit a web page containing JavaScript code, the browser just downloads it and executes it. And so I'd like to claim, it's not really a contentious claim, I hope, that one of the reasons that web applications have been such a great success is that it's really easy to build web applications. And that's because you could sort of say that web applications are the apotheosis of open source. Like, the code has to be downloaded to the browser, at least the JavaScript code for the client side. And so that means anybody out there who runs that web app at least can totally see what the uh, JavaScript code is for implementing that browser side functionality. And they can steal it, borrow it, repurpose it, and reuse it. And this is exactly what people do. It's really easy to reuse code from existing web applications because of the way the web works. And so you wind up with these web apps that are sort of pastiches. You sort of cobble together little fragments of JavaScript and libraries, some more modular than others, from other sites. But interestingly, they're written by other parties. Even if you're developing a web app yourself, you often cobble together code written by other parties. And so once you say that you're going to be running web applications uh, and that you're going to be using code written by other parties, maybe we should pause a moment just to think about privacy. Right? So obviously, a lot of these applications you use handle data that you would consider sensitive. Maybe your bank statements, your location, your email. Um, and of course, yeah? Is this something, the, the, the fact that you use a bunch of libraries potentially written by third party developers. Unique to the web? Yeah, is it unique to the web? No, it's not. Absolutely not. So there's open source software, right? And so there are like third party libraries that people use all the time in open source software. So I'm not claiming that this is the first time there's been open source libraries. I'm simply claiming that it is the, in every web application. It is sort of the norm, almost required, that there's a bunch of open source on the, on the browser side, which is not true for other applications. Well, in the web, though, you'd be sourcing those uh, libraries from a third party host, which has the ability to change those things, right? That's correct. That's different from, you know, load That's also, well from some also correct, and that will come up later in the talk as well, in fact. Um, actually, although you don't have to source from a third party, you could also host it on your own site, right, right, right. So, uh, so this JavaScript developer, of course, could be malicious, um, right? So uh, the user doesn't know any of these developers who wrote the third-party code. And you know, if you asked a computer science undergraduate, was it advisable to run programs presented to you by parties you don't trust, they'd probably say no. 
Of course, your browser does it without asking you every time you visit a website. Um, and of course, even in a single running browser, you visit multiple sites in different tabs, right? This is commonplace in one binary that you're running. So many of you are web architecture experts already, and so this is a broad audience talk, so I apologize for boring you for a couple of slides as we sort of work up to where we want to get. Okay. Um, so here's a quick example that's very relevant in London where I live, which I call bad weather. And it goes like this. You're running a browser, you have a couple of tabs open, you visit your bank account, looks like things aren't looking so good long term there, and you visit uh, a weather website. Uh, this was obviously not for London. Um, and you are, uh, browsing these two tabs at the same time. Uh, and one thing you might ask yourself is if the developer of weather.com is not a nice person. So no third party, at least with respect to weather.com itself, just the first party who wrote weather.com put some bad JavaScript in the weather.com page. So what's to stop weather.com from just reading your bank statement and from chase.com and leaking it and sending it to the guy who wrote the code for weather.com and runs the server? So of course, as you all presumably already know, in the beginning there was the same origin policy. And what this said um, was that we'll have a rule, a policy baked into the browser that if there's code inside weather.com and it was retrieved from the origin, or you might just think of it as a domain name, weather.com, we'll say that that code is not allowed to read from data from other origins either inside the browser or from other servers, in fact, from other origins, right? Same origin policy. Um, so not from the server chase.com, um, and in fact, chase.com is not allowed to read from weather.com either, right? And so the same origin policy in brief just says that you disallow cross-origin reads between contexts. What's a context? It's a tab, but contexts are also hierarchical. Inside of a tab, you could have an iframe or other constructs in the browser architecture that are contexts for browsing. And so, of course, this is a form of uh, discretionary access control. Right? You have a, a decision about yes or no. You can either read something, in which case it's yours, and you can do whatever you want with it thereafter. Or you can't read something, and that's it. You just can't read it ever. Right? So what's interesting about the same origin policy is that you can quickly show that at least the way browsers use it, it's, it sort of fails at opposite ways at the same time. It's both too permissive and too restrictive. Some of the time it lets things happen that shouldn't happen. And some of the times it keeps you from doing things that you'd really like to do that would be very useful. Um, so for example, it's too permissive. Um, if you have third party code, so we're not saying first party JavaScript in a site now, third party that you took from somewhere else. If there's malicious third party code that the Barclays bank didn't know was malicious, and they included it in their site, say, in a script tag, then if you enclose JavaScript code in a page, that third-party code runs with the page's authority. Right? And so this means that actually that malicious JavaScript could read bank statement data from inside the page and leak it to, say, evil.com. There's nothing disallowing that in the SOP. So it's too permissive, but it's also too restrictive, right? Sometimes it would be really nice if you want to build mashup applications to be able to read data across origins. So for example, you might have a third party who under their own domain name wants to publish a useful web application, like something like Quicken. The web version of this exists. It's called Mint, right? Recently acquired by Intuit. Um, and so what you'd like to do is be able to render in the browser graphs of sort of all of your expenses and how you've been spending your money integrated from all of your bank statements from the different credit cards and bank accounts that you have. Right? So this is what Quicken used to do on the client side as a binary application. Mint.com does it on the web. And it turns out that when Mint.com, if they wanted to write this in JavaScript, and why shouldn't they be able to, they just can't. Because uh, the same origin policy, we'll get to more complicated things than the SOP in just a moment, doesn't let code from mint.com read from originschase.com or hsbc.com. So it just can't, can't write the application and have it run. Yeah? But fundamentally, uh, I don't want to pick on you too much, but it's not obvious that client-side composition is what they desire because of the lack of any sort of integrity enforcement on the client in the first place. And so typically who, who desires? Sorry, which Mint.com. So these days, all of this composition happens server-side, and the client gets oh, I'm going to talk about what happens today in just a moment, but yeah. Um, so sorry, I, I 
don't follow, what is the thing that Mint doesn't want? They're worried about integrity? Client-side integrity is not something that is supported by today's browsers. Sure. So it's not obvious. So it's supported by the system I'm going to be telling you about today that's our work, in addition to secrecy. But Okay, uh, but it's not obvious that you know they're, they're kind of they have a burning desire to have everything on the client in terms of composition. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about some of the downsides of the way Mint, from the user's perspective, is implemented today, which I'm sure you already know. Um, so you know it's not just what Mint wants, but it's what users may want too. So I'll be talking about that in just a few more moments. Yeah. So I guess I was going to ask the same question, but maybe really <coughs> tell me if this is literally the same question, which is. Today, the way Mint.com works is that I have to give it all my passwords to yes. Mint.com and HSBC.com. Yes. They pull the data on the server, yeah. scrape the pages, or do right. something. Maybe they have better. Right. So, this is part of my talk, actually. But yes, that's what they do. And, and I would say. Sorry? And you say there is something wrong with it. And I say that my releasing my credentials to my bank accounts yeah. to a third party sucks. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, of course, People saw that this same origin policy failed in a variety of ways early on. And so they keep making these Band-Aid fixes to the same origin policy, one after another as the browser evolves over time. Um, so these uh, that are most commonly used are cores and CSP. We'll talk about CSP first. CSP is content security policy. And it's a way of tightening the SOP and making it more restrictive than it would be by default. And the way that this works, roughly speaking, is in one bullet that a server uh, can whitelist origins to which a page can send requests. Okay, so you can explicitly uh, whitelist some origins. And not, so wait, I'm whitelisting, but that's, why is that tightening? Well, because the things that you don't whitelist by default will now not be able to be contacted by the page. So if there's malicious JavaScript in chase.com, and chase.com does not explicitly whitelist evil.biz, then even if chase.com included malicious JavaScript in a script tag, the script would be prohibited from leaking to evil.biz. Right. OK. Then there's cores, cross-origin resource sharing, which is sort of the complement, in a way, to CSP. It lets the server say that it wants to loosen the same origin policy by whitelisting different origins than the server's origin that can read from the page. OK, so for example, uh, if you wanted to implement Mint, maybe for some reason hsbc.com would whitelist mint.cc because they wanted their bank customers to be able to use Mint on the bank statements from HSBC. And maybe Chase would say, no way, I'm not up for that. Um, in fact, most banks would say, no way, I'm not up for it because banks are worried about liability of what happens to data that they send over the internet to a customer. Um, in fact, Banks are also, well, banks are worried about fraud and all kinds of other things that could hurt the bank, um, in the, at least in the model where banks bear the cost of fraud, um, which may or may not continue, I'm told. Um, so, uh, OK, so all of this is still discretionary access control, right? Yeah. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how these extensions came about? Like, did, were, did somebody design these and then go argue for them in IETF, or did they go convince Chrome or IE or somebody? To sure. So, then, so know, it's just what you would expect, which is not very pretty. So um, you know, we had a browsing architecture. We had the same origin policy. People found that web developers found and browser designers found that there were certain kinds of applications or certain kinds of vulnerabilities that they didn't like. The W3C had working groups that started talking about some of these things with browser vendors. And then there's a standards process at W3C. W3C can't force browser vendors to do things, but you know, there's some decision process. Just as if the IETF creates a standard, W3C proposes a standard, and then uh, browser vendors decide if they're going to implement it based on whether they feel like it really matters enough, whether it's worth their resources, and so on. That's my understanding of how we got here, basically. Well, I think in some cases it was more organic, like for instance, uh, the fact that images can be sourced from domains interchangeably. I think that's just kind of something that came up in the 90s, right? Because that's how people wanted images were relatively huge at that point. That's right. 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 So, sorry, the question you were asking was about these things. What I described was how these things came about. Mm -hmm. Other things are completely ad hoc and just sort of came about because somebody thought it was a good idea at some point. Um, so the question is, so this is all still discretionary access control, though. So is this good enough? We have more flexible discretionary access control. 
Well, I would argue no, it's still not good enough. And so let me try to give you a couple examples of why this is. The first example is one I've already alluded to, which is third-party mashups. So consider Mint.com. This is what you guys were already talking about just a moment ago. How does Mint.com work today, and what might be some of the reasons why it works that way today? Um, so Mint.com makes you pretty graphs of how much money you're spending. Um, and uh, today, the browser can't support a secure third-party mashup version of Mint.com. Why? Well, let's talk about why. So if you have a choice, basically, what discretionary access control gives you is a choice between uh, functionality and privacy. It literally forces you to choose only one in some situations like this. So in the case of uh, privacy, if banks decided that they were not going to allow cores overrides to let Mint.com read data from Chase and HSBC, then, well, that's strong privacy, but no Mint.com app for the user on the browser side. Right? So no functionality, yes, privacy. Or the, uh, if cores allowed Mint.com's JavaScript to read from the banks, then you'd wind up with functionality. You'd be able to run Mint.com in the browser. But of course, where the horse has left the barn. Right now, the JavaScript hosted by Mint.com has your data from your banks, and there's nothing stopping it from sending that data elsewhere or to Mint.com's server. Yeah. Go to their middle ground where you use you put each origin's content in frames, and then you allow each uh, origin to control the content side of its own frame, and then if uh, two frames want to communicate, they have to use post message. Yes. Right? So it seems like there's sort of like this third ground, which you know allows, for example, Chase.com to control what graphs it shows in its own frame. But then Mint.com can't directly poke at it and say, like, you know, give me your sensitive JavaScript heat data. I see. And so which code is Mint contributing to this in this model that you're talking about? Like, what scripts is Mint running? Yeah, so it's unclear, right? So this is why it's kind of a middle ground. Because in this case, Mint could, for example, query each one of those frames. Right. And, you know, what are you willing to disclose? Right. Or, you know, could you display this? Right. Right. But Mint doesn't actually get to mandate that. And so uh, that's, that's just one thing to think about because in part, people already try to use frames as these sort of isolation. Yes, that's right. Of this reason. right. But you're exactly right that it's sort of, you know, the, the aggregator has this very weak control over what the app does. Right. It's asking for favors. Basically. Right. So if Mint wants to make sure that its app works, they sort of supplicate to the frames owned by Chase and HSBC in your model. Another interesting question is, who's in control of the data? Whose data is it? Is it Chase or is it me if I'm Chase's customer, if I decide that I want to run the Mint app? Um, so, um, right. So, in reality, as Jitsu already uh, described, uh, what Mint does is it just asks all its users for their bank login credentials and it pulls them to Mint's servers. Um, and you might say, oh God, nobody would ever do that. What a terrible idea. Well, Mint has over 10 million users, which is why Intuit just bought them. Um, so, I believe, and I think many people should believe that this is an abysmal model for privacy. Um, OK, so a, this was actually a somewhat more complicated example of why discretionary access control might not be sufficient. Let's just give them a simpler example that was one that comes up a fair bit. Um, lots of people uh, incorporate third-party libraries into their web apps. right? And so a big thing that people want to do, since passwords suck so much, is have a password strength checker on their website when you sort of uh, create a password. It gives you a green icon if the password's considered good and a red one if it's considered weak. So if Chase wants to integrate uh, a script from sketchy.ru, uh, which does password strength checking, today, um, you know, Chase has the password right, uh, that you typed into a form there. And if it were willing to, say, using post message, send the password to a script run by sketchy.ru, well, then sketchy.ru has the password, and you know, it's all over at this point. Right? So that's, that's what would happen today, pretty much. Um, but are there real cases of uh, large companies using untrusted services in this manner? I mean, the previous yeah. example. There's jQuery, for example. jQuery is used by 77% of the Quantcast top 10,000 sites, actually. People typically put jQuery code in their website. Like or, or rather use the Google CDN. Actually, wait, stop. <laughs> why, does it, why does it matter? <laughs> right? I don't understand why one's better than the other. If it's pulled from jQuery.org, somebody could own jQuery.org. 
if it's hosted on their website, do they like audit all of jQuery? Wait a minute, but that doesn't mean it's not a problem. Enough, no, enough right, people right, are right. using jQuery that if jQuery starts sending random stuff to random places, uh -huh. it's... So we shouldn't worry about it. No, that's not, not what he's saying. I, I'm saying with, with, any, uh, right, with any untrusted code, right, there's part of the safety you get with jQuery is safety in numbers. Lots of people are using it, which means lots of people are also debugging with it, trying to figure out mm -hmm. what the heck's going on when they're using it. That's right. So, and, and enough people have problems with it that they have to go in and look at the code to figure out what the heck's yeah. going on sometimes. So if you do download, if, if you run it off the site, yes, if the site's compromised tomorrow, you're vulnerable tomorrow. Right. If you got a copy from a month ago, you've got a pretty good sense that, you know, uh, of, of the things, of the libraries you could be using, this is something where the code is public, everyone just does. So, you know, I think we, we could have an interesting debate that I don't know if I have time for right now about this. There have been back doors found in all kinds of software, not necessarily JavaScript software, that have been deeply embedded and lying there and nobody spotted them and then they became active at a particular time, right? I mean, I, I'm not, I agree with you that like, if you use a library a lot of people use, that's a lot of eyes. And that's the traditional open source argument coming from a Microsoft employee. I love it. But, um, you know, uh, is that a strong guarantee? No, right? No, but you were using the same argument, right? I would argue that Fox has actually left the bun already. You use that laptop to access the website. The laptop runs free BSD. The fact that it's open source is irrelevant because you never actually probably read the entire free BSD source code. Sorry, no. Um, no. Uh, what we're talking about here is there's going to be, it's just like in any secure system, there are going to be components that you trust and components that you don't trust. So you are making a reductio ad absurdum argument. And what I'm saying is I'm not talking about whether I trust the operating system code or not. I'm not talking about even whether I trust the browser binary or not. I do. Sorry, I am talking about it. You do trust those things. What I'm talking about is scripts that are malicious and how to confine scripts that may be malicious. So you got to trust something. So, um, right, well, we're done. Even if the library looks like it does the right thing, it says, oh, yeah, that was a weak password. It's, it's already gone. So this was just two quick examples. Um, but discretionary access control actually fails in a lot of situations. I talked to you about third-party mashups, and I talked to you about uh, libraries with narrow APIs, like a password strength checker. Um, there are other kinds of... Uh, uh, situations where untrusted code, JavaScript, could be dangerous, right? One of them is you could actually have mutually distrusting services. So imagine that you had an online document editor, and it provided code for document editing. And then you wanted to have an encrypted online document editor, right, that um, actually made sure that when your document was stored in the cloud, it was always encrypted. And so you might decide that there was some organization you really trusted to write the crypto code for some reason. And uh, maybe you trusted Google to write the document editor code, but not the crypto code. How would the trust work out? Maybe Google doesn't, Google's editor code doesn't trust EFF. Maybe EFF doesn't trust Google. You would need some kind of architecture to sort of let you compose this code together and still build a working application. And you could also have libraries. The password strength checker is an easy case. The harder case is a library with no API, um, or almost no API, which is jQuery. Uh, jQuery sort of requires you to include it in the page in order to work. Um, and so it has unfettered access to everything in your page. And that's just what jQuery is. You can't use jQuery unless you're willing to do that. Um, so. If we step back for a moment, maybe part of the problem is just that discretionary access control is too brittle as a design. So all of these things, SOP, content security policies, cross-origin resource sharing, they all either deny access or just give up control of the data utterly to the reader once they allow reading. Um, right? So even in the case where you used frames, like James was saying, you still completely give up control of the data. If the bank makes a bad call and says, oh, yes, I trust this domain, and the script turns out to be malicious, then you know, the, the script can do whatever it wants with the data after that, because the bank made the wrong call with discretionary access control. So I would say that this all or nothing behavior of discretionary access control is a bad fit for the web, because the web is a scenario where applications routinely integrate untrusted code. And 
we have this unpalatable choice I described of privacy versus functionality. Will my app work, or, um, or can I have privacy but not both? So the challenge I'd like to try to address in this talk is how can we achieve both privacy and functionality in web applications? Okay, so making, sensitive, making sure that sensitive data is not leaked by untrusted code, but letting people build featureful web applications on the browser side. Okay. So the germ of a solution is a very old idea. In fact, computer science is really starting to have some gray hair as a field, I realize, when I put this citation in the slide. But uh, you know, you've all heard of confinement. Butler Lampson articulated the idea in 1973, although it's been fairly elusive in real systems that people use every day. And the idea in confinement is very easy to state as a goal, which is that let's just let untrusted code read sensitive data, but prevent the untrusted code from leaking the data. Right? So in the mint.com third-party mashup example, the fantasy version of this is, yeah, so you let the JavaScript from mint.com read all the bank statement data, and then something, maybe it's the browser core, after those reads happen, somehow prevents Mint from getting outside of this brick wall and sending anything anywhere, even to the mint.com origin, right, anywhere. So you could say, oh, well, confinement. There's been a million papers on confinement. Isn't this a solved problem? You know, we have confinement for Haskell, confinement for Java. Everybody knows GIF, right? Or uh, you could change JavaScript itself to enforce information flow control, right? There have been a bunch of papers on adding fine-grained IFC to JavaScript, JS flow, and so forth. Um, and what the semantics, the changed semantics of JavaScript are after you make that addition. Um, but if you want to practically deploy confinement in the web browser, there are some design constraints that are pretty harsh. Um, one of them is that it's possible web developers may not be willing to learn a new language, or at least many of them. They like JavaScript. Um, also, you can't really touch the JavaScript runtime, or it's very, very hard to do so. So uh, as you probably know, the V8 JavaScript engine, for example, or SpiderMonkey, they're just in time compiled and very, very highly optimized. Um, and in the browser performance wars, people behave somewhat irrationally. There's sort of zero tolerance for you know, adding one instruction on the hot path for uh, running JavaScript code, because it's going to make some table of numbers you know, go up by a millisecond and mean you're not the fastest browser anymore in some ridiculous evaluation. Um, so um, people are very hostile to adding anything at all in functionality that's on the hot path in the JavaScript runtime. Also, you, you got to keep JavaScript, but there are also concepts in place that web devs are used to, like the idea of origins as principles, which started with the same origin policy. It'd be nice if we could keep that. And um, ideally, you'd keep the same in-page constructs, like the kinds of things James was mentioning, you know, iframes, pages, and so on, as security boundaries, which is what people already are familiar with. So the good news is, if you look at the web right, but by accident, the web is a pretty good fit for confinement. You just have to look at it right. So why might I say the browser is hospitable to confinement? Well, browsers already have execution contexts, um, things like frames and iframes. Um, and isolation is enforced by the browser across these boundaries in these execution contexts already uh, with discretionary access control. So maybe we could enforce mandatory access control but at a context granularity. So at a frame and iframe and tab granularity, not at a JavaScript object granularity. And so what that would mean is if we didn't have to mess with the implementation of individual objects, we wouldn't need to change the JavaScript runtime at all. Like we could actually bake mandatory access control into the same places in the browser that enforce discretionary access control between frames today. And it's pretty easy to add new APIs to the browser that manipulate the content of uh, context. It's the so-called DOM, the document object model. You can attach policies to messages. There's a very rich substrate in place for uh, making enhancements to the browser there. So our system is called Cowl. It's confinement with origin web labels. And it, it draws on in some sense, mostly known concepts, but we put a lot of work into trying to express the concepts in the form of practical primitives for the web. So, and the primitives are actually very few. We have a primitive of labels, 
which are based on web origins, uh, which are used to specify mandatory access control policies. I'll say more about all of these in just a moment. We have labeled communication, which is what lets us enforce mandatory access control between contexts, separate browsing contexts. Um, and we do this in a way that lets you uh, not have to change the existing post message API that people are already familiar with. And finally, there are privileges. Um, and privileges are a primitive in our system that let you express trust. Um, and in particular, where this arises is sometimes in mandatory access control, you might want to declassify data and decide that you can release data without uh, limiting its propagation anymore. But you would want only trusted code to do that. So a privilege is a concept in our system, a primitive in our system, that it makes explicit the right to declassify in our mandatory access control system. A context can have a privilege with respect to a label or not. Yeah, James. So what happens when these labels and whatnot get into the DOM and into the renderer? I mean, it seems like the renderer is like this just seething morass of evil. And so for example, like, can I leak things via like CSS animation timing? For Are you talking about covert channels in the browser? Well, I mean, in, in the renderer side of the DOM itself. So, so yes, yeah, so like, I mean, it seems like, because one thing you were mentioning earlier is that you try to you want to try to not modify the JavaScript engine if possible. Right. You want to try to leverage sort of these pre-existing choke points yeah. that exist in the browser. But if there are sort of these side channels or covert things yeah. that happen inside the, the, the DOM, yep. then is I mean that's exactly where attackers are gonna go, right? No, that's where they'll go next, yes. Well, um, I mean I think that those are two separate questions on some level. So what happens when the labels go into the DOM and how does how much implementation overhead does that? I don't mean performance overhead, right. limitation overhead. Effort. Does that yeah. occur? Effort. And second, there, of course, there's always the question about side channels, which are numerous and exotic and so, Sure. So there are a lot of side channels. And I've got a slide talking about slide, side channels later in the talk. Um, the short answer is we have not advanced to dealing with side channels yet in this work. We're looking at closing the enormous overt channels that are already there. But you'll speak about the DOM, like how you know, labels can live in the DOM and what that means. Uh, we've not really progressed there either yet. So we don't have. But you see the message through post message yeah. as a label, yeah. which is fine at the time of. In the JavaScript runtime, it's all good. Yeah. Right? Uh, then it goes, it, uh, it gets written out to the DOM. Is there a marker within the DOM that. So the context, the context will have the label. This will become more clear maybe when I talk about how we implement labels in just a moment. But so the. Okay, maybe I'll ask that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about how we do this, since that's what you're curious to know. Um, for labels, every piece of data um, in our system is protected by a label. And what the label specifies uh, in terms of origins is basically who cares about the data. You can think of it loosely that way. So for example, if there's data that's sensitive to Chase, it would just be labeled with the origin chase.com. Or if there's data sensitive to both Chase and HSBC, it would be labeled with the conjunction of Chase.com and HSBC.com. And you'd say, what, why, why would there be data sensitive, data sensitive to both? Well, for example, if you were running that third party mashup for Mint and you synthesized something out of data from both, that's the label you'd wind up with notionally. Right? So uh, what does this look like? Servers on their responses can set labels um, in an HTTP header. Um, and in the browser, a browsing context, whatever it is, a tab, a frame, uh, can have a label associated with it. How do we track labels? As I've already said, Cal tracks labels at the server and context, browsing context granularity. So pages, iframes, workers, servers. Um, and one thing is that you can label for convenience for the developer. We let you label a, mess in, a message that you send with post message differently from the context in which you sent the message. Yeah? What prevented that password data being labeled as being sensitive to eBay.com? Because it doesn't it depend on who set up the password box. Uh, so the password box itself was, let's say, a jQuery rendered box. Yeah. jQuery could potentially label it, assuming jQuery is evil. Yeah. That password box itself could be set up so that anything entered there is tagged as evil.com, right? And Chase would have no clue. Uh, what is the root of integrity? Yeah. Right. So uh, the, the authority to set a label in our system 
uh, comes from what the origin is, where the content was retrieved from. But the password box was retrieved from, was rendered by a renderer given by jQuery, right? jQuery, when jQuery renders like a date drop box or something, uh -huh. where is okay, the so, uh, okay, jQuery is actually, maybe, I don't know if what you're asking is specific to jQuery. We have a whole different schema. There's a different way of dealing with jQuery in our system that I did not describe here because it would make my talk too long. It is in the paper. So is this something about jQuery in particular that you're asking about? Yeah, dynamic HTML. So for example, the way at least I, I, I'm not a power user of jQuery. I use yeah. it only a few times, right? But the way I would do this is I would set a element with ID. Yeah. And I would tell jQuery to essentially replace that with a box and you know, whatever. Yeah. So at that time, who labels that data? That's what I'm asking. The so what you're pointing out yes. is that the usage model for jQuery is that it runs with the authority of the enclosing page, sure. right? That is specific to jQuery. Password checker libraries that we're talking about are a different use model, where they are not enclosed in a script tag in the page, and they do not run with the authority of the enclosing page. They're in a separate context. And this is another model that people use JavaScript in. Okay, so it is, I now understand your question. I have a backup slide that I'll be happy to, I could jump to it now if you want on how we yeah, handle jQuery. Basically, the answer to your question is this. If you want to enclose untrusted code with a script tag, no, way to no. Oh. we have a way to do it. But what it, what it involves, it almost looks like open SSH privilege separation. What you wind up doing is you have two compartments. You drop privilege on the one that has jQuery. And then you have a small trusted code base running in a separate browsing context. And that's sort of a firewall between the jQuery context and the rest of the network. That's the sort of high level idea. But that is specific to jQuery um, and libraries like jQuery that only work if you include them with a script tag because they want to touch the DOM directly. Yeah. OK, great questions. So um, label tracking was where I was. So for convenience, we let uh, programmers label a message that they send with post message differently than the browsing, different, with a different label than the browsing context. It has to be at least as restrictive as the browsing context label, but you can set uh, a different label. Um, so this turns out to be a convenient way to share sensitive data. Um, so for example, if chase.com downloads a page to your browser, if your browser downloads a page from chase.com, the initial label is what we call public, which means no restriction. Think of it as the null label. Okay. Then if Chase wants to send that password to a third party library with a narrow API, unlike jQuery, then it will use post message to send the password to that library. And it's free to, in the CAL system, set a label more restrictive than the one of the base page. Right. But of course, browser server communication had better Respect labels, that's very important, right? So um, we need somehow to make sure that um, there's no way the browser would enforce uh, that there's no way for uh, code contained in chase.com with a browsing context with label chase.com to send that password from that browsing context to some other origin, right? That's not desired in this model. Um, and communication across browser contexts should respect labels too, right? So in addition, because wh why is that important? Well, if sketchy.ru is running its library in a separate context that has label public, and then chase.com's context sent the password to sketchy.ru, then you wouldn't want it has to be transitive. You wouldn't want sketchy.ru to then be able to go ahead and send that password to the origin that it was downloaded from. So this stuff is not composable using CSP? I mean, it seems like CSP is designed to stop a lot of these types, like specifically these types of flows. So CSP is designed for this kind of flow. It doesn't help you at all with third-party mashups. So we have two papers on this work. The first paper was a hot OS paper where what we did was we described how Using mandatory access control lets you do things that you can't do with cores and CSP, and it also subsumes them. So it is strictly more general. 
So you are correct that some of the examples I'm giving are things that you could do with CSP. The third-party mashup is one that you cannot. The mutually distrusting document editor is one that you cannot. So. So I'm thinking about the min.com example you gave one, mm -hmm. right? So presumably here, HSBC and Chase will both set their contexts so that no data can ever be sent to the min.com server, and any processing that min.com does would have to be now done on my local machine. Correct. Okay. Now, min.com provides, this is a purely functionality question, min.com provides a number of compatible services which requires it to transmit some data back to the server. Otherwise, it's kind of useless, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, wait a minute. So, for example, my rate of return versus other people's rate of return on certain mutual funds, something like that, right? I'm just making up an example. So that is now that door is closed. Unless Chase and HSBC both allow pretty much any rate of good event. Or unless, you know, you're going to try using some of Google's new differential privacy stuff for sending stuff privately back from the browser to the server. I don't know. I mean... So presumably, but as soon as the Mint computes any mashup, it would be labeled as... Correct. Back, back That's back absolutely back, correct. correct. Right? Absolutely correct. You'll have the label, the secrecy label of HSBC and Chase, which and means Chase. no one in the universe so, at that point. Right. Correct. So... So uh, if you have an application... So there is an answer to this. If you have an application uh, that... Um, okay, wait. So there, for the example you gave, where there's data that is derived directly from data that is sensitive to the user. The presumption in this design is that the user doesn't want data derived from that data to be computed by a third party and leaked anywhere. I don't want min.com to have my password. I don't care so much if min.com has my bank balance. OK, well, there are a lot of people who would disagree with that statement, OK? Well, but, but well, 10 million users. <laughs> Sorry, wait a minute. You can't just say that it's obvious that nobody would care that Mint.com has their bank balance. No, I'm balance. giving you another usage example. Of course, other, some people might care. Right. I'm just saying that At my password is more sensitive. It, it's, it's a complex negotiation because right, Mint.com is going to know what stocks I own. Otherwise, it can't go out and get quotes for them. Uh, and if it can't go out and get quotes for them, then I lose functionality. So, okay, just... No. I don't know. The browser could get quotes for them. It's not like Mint needs to know what stocks you have. There are plenty of open quote services that the browser could directly yes, but, pull but to but get those I'm quotes. Gonna, but, no, but, no, but if no, I'm no, visiting Mint.com on a slow 3G connection on my phone, yeah. now all of a sudden there are a lot of round trips that my browser is doing. Uh -huh. and it's so much slower than if Mint actually had access to everything uh -huh. and went and did all the work and sent me back a single HTML page right. so with all the content. I, I accept that. Yep. These, are, these are all complex negotiations, but I think the question you're asking is what's called declassification in the yeah. context of language-based type C. Right. It sounds like you don't have a mechanism. We do have a mechanism for declassification. There's, okay, so there's support for declassification, okay. but the question is, who has the authority to exercise that? That's always the question. Right. And how correct is it? Right, exactly, exactly you, right. We'll speak with that as well. Uh, very briefly, very briefly. So if min.com is just like at the height of that lattice, there is no way to go back, it sounds like. Right, that's right. All right, so we went through this already. So in order for this example to work of the third-party password strength checker, um, we're going to need some way for the script provided by sketchy.ru to see the data and compute over it. So the way that we're going to do this, as you do in information flow control systems, is by having a context adopt a more restrictive label, by giving up its ability to communicate with uh, places that should not be able to see the sensitive data, it will be then be allowed to read the sensitive data. Okay, so, uh, for example, sketchy.ru could receive a post message from chase.com with the password in it labeled. It's a labeled post message, right, um, with the label chase.com. It then possesses the labeled message, but the browser will prohibit it from seeing the content of the message. Okay? So it knows that it received a message, but it doesn't know what's inside. Then it is free to, this is important for, you know, it would be inconvenient if when you received a message, your label was forced by the browser to be raised immediately because you just suddenly would find you couldn't talk to the world anymore. So instead, we let you have the message labeled, but you can't read it, 
before the browser will let you read the content, what will happen is you will need to choose to raise your label, which will mean you'll lose the ability to communicate with other origins than the origin of the label question. And that communication includes anything, gets, posts, yes, puts. Yes, anything, yes. But the presence of a label, or the presence of a message, I should say, is a channel of sorts as well. The presence of a message is a channel. We don't even let you inspect the label um, until you have raised your label accordingly. The number of messages. Yes, you could. Said. Yes, absolutely right. It's cover a channel. Yeah. So would I be able to use this to do the stock picking example, where you know I go access chase, I'm mint.com, I go access chase.com, I get the list of uh, stocks that you have, and then I use, I want to use some other third-party service yes. to go pull down stock information for each one of those. Yes, it will work. OK. And um, you'll tell us how. Um, yes. The answer is partly privilege separation, um, which I'm not going to get into that much in this talk, unfortunately. Um, but uh, to conclude my example, uh, finally, the password checker can reply with weak. It did its work. It was confined. It could not leak the password to sketchy.ru. And then it returns its result back to Chase. Right. So the sort of summary of the design sketch is that uh, origins are a natural way to specify labels for the web. Um, you, can already, you can leverage the contexts that are already there as security boundaries. Um, and origins can be used to express privileges. And this. Uh, has to do with declassification. And uh, for time reasons, I'm not going to go into detail on declassification on the talk. Uh, basically, this is how we handle things like jQuery. You need declassification, it turns out, to handle things like jQuery. Um, so. jQuery is compromised, you're still host. No, incorrect. Because let's say you're using .text in jQuery. Uh -huh. You are relying on jQuery to make sure that a string uh, doesn't contain any dangerous HTML. J jQuery is part of your trusted computing base. OK, so, so let me show you my slide on jQuery, since we're going to go there, it appears. And then I'm really going to need to continue with my talk, or I won't complete my talk. Um, so uh, I'm not going to walk you through absolutely all of this. The high level of this is you know how privilege separation works in OpenSSH, right? Great. So what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, site a.com that wants to use jQuery. What it's going to do is um, it's going to drop its privilege and not have the privilege to declassify label a.com. Okay? Which, and it's going to set its um, label uh, to be a unique label so that it's not allowed to talk to any network anywhere, no one on the internet. What we're going to do is have a separate compartment that's where the trusted code base is. This is not where jQuery is. jQuery is going to be executing in the low privilege compartment, just like an open SSH, right? A trusted code, untrusted code. And then what we're going to have is um, basically the trusted code is going to download jQuery and inject it into the DOM of the untrusted compartment. And then after that, all communication that the page with the possibly malicious jQuery in it wants to make to the outside world has to be mediated by the trusted compartment because there's no communication allowed to the internet by, by force of the label. Sure. So how does this, how does the dot text thing break through this? Because when I'm using dot text, what I am doing is I'm telling jQuery, this is something that could have dangerous, this is a string that could have dangerous stuff in it. I want you to, to HTML encode it mm -hmm. so that it's safe to put in the web page. Mm -hmm. So I am using jQuery as part of my TCB to say, take this string from something that's not safe to put in HTML into something that is safe to put to HTML. OK. But and still, but, but the only place jQuery can it. HTML tag, which is a, a function that's supposed to let me put the dangerous stuff but in. But jQuery is going to inject this potentially malicious HTML into its own frame, right? Into its own. So the entire page is its in different frames? Sorry. I think what you just said is dot text is sanitizing. Right. Right? It's just so, so there could be a malicious page. sanitizer, is what you're postulating, that does not properly sanitize. Correct. Excellent. So that's running here in this low privilege compartment, right? And so now what can it do? 
it can like so, in, inject more content inside of this compartment, right? So the whole, but that's where the whole web page is, is it not? Yes. Using jQuery? Yes, but the page is confined. It's not allowed to talk to the internet. Is anyone allowed to talk to the internet? Yeah. In other words, <laughs> is there any, so, so in other words, if jQuery, can anyone get, even if that thing on the left is sandboxed, if mm -hmm. there's a pipe that then allows sort of the stuff that's sandboxed to get to anywhere else in the network, then I think what Stuart's saying is that if the content on the left is sandbox, fine. It itself can't do anything, chicane, right? What it can do is it, the only thing it will be able to do is go through the trusted compartment right. and send messages to the trusted compartment. So the, the moment you open up the possibility of an XSS attack, this is exactly what's going to happen. They'll just follow the pipe. Right? Uh -huh. That's right. So maybe to, uh, to Stuart's point. <laughs> but on the wait, sorry, but. You can put whatever code you want in the trusted compartment, right? To mitigate. No, no. The point is that if you have some XSS or some uh, malicious sanitization, yes. on the left, right. it can trigger undesirable or unexpected, what have you, messages to the compartment on the right. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Just like in OpenSSH, when you have a monitor process, sure. somebody can own the untrusted compartment and send whatever RPCs they would like over IPC right. to the monitor. But yet, we don't seem to think that open SSH privilege separation is useless. But what you do is you. It's a very, it, you, it's a very thin connector, right? You've got a very thin, well defined set of. And why could I not have a thin, well defined thing here for the serialized communication between that context and this context since I designed what this code is? Because uh, the level of skill for somebody working with uh, in the code of open SSL is probably different from that working you know, on web applications. Here. OK, so that's a, I understand the argument that you're making, but that is not an impossibility argument. That is a skill level argument. Just obs observation. Right, 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 right. right. Well. I agree. Yeah. Um, so yes, like you could craft malicious messages and send them here. I would say that that is better than being able to send whatever you want directly to the internet. Because there is code that a potentially smart person could have written and had audited that is going to inspect what those messages are. And you know, on some level, privilege separation is one of the only things we have in our arsenal against compromise of code in compartments and systems. I mean, I'd be happy to continue this conversation offline. Um, back to the talk. <clears throat> all right, so I'll just breeze through this since I think you all completely understood how the system worked already from the questions that you've been asking. Uh, we can use the primitives I've described to implement Mint as a third party mashup. Uh, Chase uses post message, labeled post message to send, uh, sorry, uh, mint.com can read labeled data from Chase's uh, context. And it can read labeled data from HSBC. However, in order to actually see the data in the messages, it needs to raise its label. It would raise its label to chase.com first, which would mean it could not talk to hsbc.com any longer. It would then raise its label to add the conjunction uh, of hsbc.com and would no longer be able to talk to chase.com or anyone else at that point. And then it can make you pretty graphs of how you're spending your money. Um, so this means that you could now implement this mashup uh, in the browser with privacy without giving your login credentials to the operator of mint.com. Uh, example two that I used as a motivator at the beginning of the talk is the third party password strength checker. Um, and I already showed you what that looked like, actually. I showed you labeled communication with sketchy.ru. Um, I actually have a demo of a Chromium browser running the password strength checker example. And I'm going to skip it because you've all had such great questions so far. And it's not much to look at, really. Um, so we built it. Um, we built implementations both for Firefox and Chromium. We made no changes whatsoever to the JavaScript engines. Um, and uh, the implementations for Gecko and Blink were about 4,000 lines of C++ each. You know, implementing a label system takes a little bit of work. Um, and we've released the Firefox implementation open source. There are also ready to run binaries that are there. You can give it a try at cal.ws. We tried very hard to emphasize deployability in our design. Um, so I'm just going to keep repeating myself. There have been no changes to the JavaScript engine. In our discussions with the V8 team at Google, it became clear to us that at least at Google, to get mandatory access control in the browser, it was not going to happen in V8. Um, 
So uh, it's just really three new JavaScript primitives. Um, so we think that it ought to be fairly familiar because it uses origins to express policies. It's fast in our performance evaluation, which the details of are in the paper. Uh, the worst page load overhead we experienced using a case that we thought was pretty punishing was just 16 milliseconds for increased page load time. Why is it fast? Why is it this fast? Well, because when you're in the inner loop of executing the JavaScript code, we didn't touch the JavaScript engine. Right? So if you've got some hairy script that's doing a lot of compute, it runs at full speed. And it's only when you cross contexts that our code to do label checks gets invoked. So, um, and it's backward compatible with legacy pages. We only start using confinement mode when you encounter a cal primitive in the page. So you've already brought up several of these things already. Uh, there are a few things worth discussing that are interesting. One of them is covert channels. What cal does is it closes the gaping overt channels that uh, the SOP and discretionary access control uh, leave in some cases. Um, so the stock browser, as you've pointed out, is rife with covert channels. Cal doesn't add covert channels, but it doesn't close them either. Um, so this means malicious code could covertly leak data through covert or side channels. Um, Cal does enforce Mac in addition to the existing DAC, however. So if you had some application where you really felt like this was military grade and you were worried about covert channels, um, you, know, you could still deny with DAC in that application. We don't break the things you might like about DAC if you want them for an application, for one application. Um, this, at one point you could make is that Nobody knows what code mint.com is running on their servers, right? Or what quality it is or how vulnerable it is. One consequence, there's lots of things you guys seem not to like about running it in the browser from crappy 3G connections to all kinds of other things. One good thing might be that um, if you forced people to use covert channels in JavaScript, they'd actually have to put the code out there for the big things, for the bad things that they were doing, which is actually a little bit more like Stuart's argument before, that because so many people are using the code and everybody can see it, you know, you might find out that there's something nasty in there. I want to find a good covert channel. So I can do it on my code. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but but is, there, is there a demand for that? Like, I could, I could go build securement.com today uh -huh. where I do as much as I possibly can in JavaScript. So you're asking to certify to users, hey, you know, I have, I'm not using third-party JavaScript libraries. Mm -hmm. You can go go look at my JavaScript code; it's there. And but but yet, you know, Mint.com today has so many users. Right. So I'll talk about this in just a couple of slides. This is the very last point I want to make. Um, another thing is that for the jQuery example, which was more complicated than the other ones, you would actually need to. You can't just for a, something like jQuery label and run the legacy code you would actually need to compartmentalize into multiple contexts that have different privileges and different labels. And that requires thought. Or to put it the way you did, um, maybe the average web developer um, would find this a little bit daunting. Um, there are some modes of use that are, we think are fairly simple. There are other modes of use that are not as simple. Um, OK, just almost done here. Uh, so for discussion, um, who should have the last word on policy in the browser? Is it the user or is it the site operator? So as I already said, Cal enforces DAC alongside Mac. So Chase might still, it might or might not set the cores header letting Mint look at Chase's data. Right? Given what bank IT departments are like, they probably wouldn't set the cores header allowing it. And so in our implementation, as I've described it so far, that means we still can't do the third party mashup because we're upholding the DAC alongside the Mac. Our view is that it's the user's data, so the user's decisions should be uppermost, not the site operators. Like if you want functionality with your data, you should be able to have that functionality. So what Cal in our current implementation lets users do is lets users in not in core syntax, but lets users specify what are effectively cores rules that enable cross-origin sharing. So for example, a user could configure the browser to say, oh, no, 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 Mint can read Chase's data. And what Cal will do is force all of that communication to be labeled to make sure that Mint scripts are confined. Okay. Now, coming back to the question, come on, is malicious JavaScript really some, yeah? 
have you? Th I was curious whether uh, this cow introduces any problems for dividing. If you want to divide, the example with me, that kind of you want to divide that thing. Yeah. Like, you know, you probably want to send some data back to mint.com that. According to Cal, should not. So sure. So after the after the la after the label gets raised, it'd be very very hard to send data back right. to Mint.com. So yeah. what's the debugging story? How do I debug? My, how does Mint.com debug their code on the client? And when something happens in deployment, in real deployment yeah, with real users. When something happens, users complain. You need to start instrumenting their code to see what the heck is going on. So that is an excellent question, um, and I. I don't have a very satisfactory answer to it right now. Um, uh, it could be that this sort of crash dump kind of in feedback is just at odds with privacy to some extent, or that we need clever new technical means. I mean, so for binaries running on the client side, if the user really cares about privacy, they say don't send back, right? So same thing. OK. So. Why are we really wasting our time with malicious JavaScript? Come on, right? So like, attackers are so successful with phishing already and installing malware on browsers just because users click OK and run binaries. So you know, isn't this just going another computer security researcher going after a problem that nobody has, right? Um, well, jQuery was hacked on September 18th and September 24th. Um, it's used by a lot of very popular websites. Now, as far as anybody knows, there wasn't any adulteration of the jQuery library when these hacks happened. There was other defacing that happened, but not of the library. There easily could have been, and it's obviously a very attractive target because so many people source it from jQuery.org and jQuery's CDN. Here's another one that's more interesting that is my current favorite of the moment. Uh, so how many of you have heard of the Baidu incident? All of you, I hope. Right, so just to review for a moment, in the Baidu attack, what happened is Baidu was hosting analytics JavaScript, right? And lots of people outside of China, sites outside of China and inside of China were using those analytics scripts, including them in their page. And it appears, at least from Vern Paxson and Nick Weaver and all those people's report analyzing uh, the Baidu attack, that what was going on was the Great Firewall, the same infrastructure that inspects network traffic at the periphery of China, uh, they found another application for the infrastructure, right? which is instead of you know, seeing if there's a request for banned content and sending an, a reset or a bogus DNS response, you could also have a new application, which the authors of this report I mentioned called Great Canon, which is um, uh, if there's something that comes in from the global internet through the same choke point, and there's some criteria met, like is this a Baidu analytics script that's being requested, then just respond immediately with a malicious script. So in the Baidu attack, what they used this for was to DDoS GitHub because it had a software project on it to circumvent the Great Firewall of China. Um, ha ha ha. Um, so the good news is it was easy to spot the Baidu DDoS because DDoS is, they're kind of noticeable when they happen. Right? But it appears that we now have a nation that has an infrastructure in place that it was willing to use at least once to send malicious JavaScript to people. It happened to be for DDoS in this case. But it could have been for something else. Right? It could have been to steal secrets from web application users, not your password for mint.com probably. But you know, there's all kinds of interesting data in web applications these days. Was this malicious JavaScript collocated with something else? Uh, the malicious, sorry, people were including Baidu analytics scripts. They used the great firewall to see the request and just reply with a malicious script that was apparently. Yes, the requests were going to Baidu, in fact. To an American website, the request goes to China for. For the analytics script, yeah. And then the browser user could be anywhere, of course. Um, of course, also TLS, you could say, oh, well, this is because you're stupid to include scripts using HTTP and not HTTPS. TLS is not historically the most convincing defense against state actors either. Right? Like, there's a lot of SIF certificates that your browser trusts, a lot of CAs that your browser trusts. There have been incidents of certificates being compromised. So, uh, to wrap up, uh, 
Discretionary access control is what browsers use today, and in many situations, it can force a choice between privacy and functionality. And users, at least if you believe Mint's users, choose functionality rather than privacy. Um, but modern web applications will need to have untrusted code compute over sensitive data if people keep building them the way they do now. So what I described to you is a system called CAL, which was an OSDI 2014. Uh, and we think it's a deployable confinement system for JavaScript. It introduces little performance cost and achieves both privacy and flexibility. You can check out our open source release. And we actually are now chartered at the W3C for Cal. Um, they're starting to look at standardizing Cal for uh, the browser architecture as standardized. <laughs> and I'd be happy to take questions. I wanted to follow up. I wanted to follow up on your on your previous slide yeah. where you said you know about the state actors. This whole this whole uh, mechanism relies on DNS origins to begin with. That's uh -huh. so fundamentally baked into everything we talked about. That at that point, you know, if if your if your if your attacker is China, we're done, right? If if the whole mechanism relies on, oh, you just have to make sure it goes to the same DNS. I mean, how broken is that? So, you know I mean, so in some sense, if if your threat model is China, we should stop. We should we should go back to square zero. That's how I guess my my argument. Passenger vision, bro. <laughs> you know, so it's it's. I think yeah. I think TLS here. I think it's a little unfair to say that it's not a convincing defense against these actors. I think same origin policy is not a convincing defense against the actors. Because let me just be. I want to narrow down to because, a very specific attack because, because the, the attack. Cost, the, 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 the cost of mounting attacks to the DNS infrastructure is so low. And what's the specific DNS-based attack that you're interested I don't know. in? I mean, I'm sure. That, uh, Sorry. Uh, we're going to have to come up with one. It's redirection attacks, for example. OK, so like, for example, you're going to cause me not to go to chase.com, or to, you're, I'm going to think I'm going to chase.com, but I'm going to download content from some other party, and you're going to be able to convince me that the TLS is valid. Or yeah, like I get the jQuery from some, you know, sketchy.ru, yeah. DNS makes me get sketchy.ru's JavaScript, and the same origin policy doesn't know about that. It just knows that, yes, I see. So what, this from. So what you're saying is that it, once TLS doesn't work, nothing works anymore, basically. Or then in general, if you have a system that, that binds security tokens to names, yeah. right. where forging right. names right. is fairly easy. easy for China, then you know, like, what are we going to do? Mm. In other words, that, we can't stop that. Maybe this is not the best example. Yeah. Maybe that name. Yeah. Not your fault, but it just. But, but I think that I, it's sort of it's my fault for my fault for choosing the example. <laughs> I struggle with awkward pauses. But but I mean I, I think that just in general I think this is a big problem for web security in general. Right. Because the same origin policy is based on these like easily spoofable origin names, right. and so as a result it becomes very careful to say like. I mean, and this is like a problem with all the anti-censorship stuff and so on and so forth on the web, because they're saying, you know, if I trust this comes from this origin, yeah. Ugh. But if that oh, name exactly. can come from anyone, yeah, exactly. Uh, I wanted to ask you about runtime enforcement mechanisms, and you didn't really talk about those. So who come, that come to mind are Kaha and Conscript, yeah. And there are different trade-offs between the two. Maybe you can. You know, uh, okay, so. Like where you fit in your thinking. So. If I remember correctly, Kaha is a subset of JavaScript. Is that it's correct? It's heavy rewriting. For the subset, you do less rewriting. Right. That's kind of the trade-off. I see. But it works for fully general, ECMA, whatever. Ish. Ish. <laughs> I'm just trying to get, OK. Yeah. So my, under, my understanding from the, from the JavaScript nerds I work with, because I'm not a core JavaScript nerd, um, I'm more of a system security person, is that uh, Kaha is not fully general to JavaScript. Maybe that's not correct. General, actually. I mean, the overhead is abysmal. I mean, that's, that's to my mind, that would be the show stuff. OK, so um, if Kaha is fully general, then I think the performance point would be the, a significant difference. Yes. Um, uh, to be honest, I personally have not looked at Kaha very, very carefully. I've looked at JS flow. I've looked at B flow. 
So I've looked at other IFC-based systems in the browser. Conscript, have you looked at that? Sorry? Conscript. Have you looked at? Conscript. I don't know that one. Where's that from? I read the paper. <laughs> I'd be delighted. That's a big question. I'd be yes. delighted. I'd, yeah. I'd be I delighted to look at it. Yeah, the uh, Lipship script. <laughs> <laughs> one of our favorites is here. All right. Oakland. Uh, 2012. I'll take a look. I mean, what we talk about in the system design that I didn't get into in the talk is that there were these design criteria that we had, which was, were that we wanted hierarchical confinement mm -hmm. so that you could have libraries that didn't trust libraries that didn't trust libraries, potentially. That's one aspect of the system that we did not see elsewhere. Um, uh, Bflow, for example, does not have that property. And the trust zones in Bflow mean that you uh, can't do third-party mashups either, but yeah. So um, I don't know of many, um, many privilege-separated apps. And I find it interesting that the one that does exist is written where the, the trusted part and the untrusted part are written by the same people who simply didn't trust themselves to write everything securely enough. There's an incentive problem in that if you're writing your stuff not to get any information out, you're getting less out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you envision this ecosystem working? Where so I guess what I'm trying to figure out is the implication of the start of your question was because OpenSSH, the, the privileged and unsep unprivileged compartments, the code is written by the same person, you're implying that in our system, the privileged and unprivileged are written by different people. Is that correct? Well, get, one's going to contain code that, uh, that's written. Right, it, you may, part of it will be written by, part of both is written by the trusted and untrusted. OK, so hang on, hang on. So the, I, the part that's written by the untrusted has to be written so that it works in this context, right? You, you can't plug, uh, say, a system that needs to send the password to the server into, uh, into something that's going to confine it. Uh, and so. Uh, well, people, people can always choose not to use libraries that are not, it, it is the choice of a developer. If they have a choice between a library that offers some security properties and one that does not. That is a choice that the developer makes. They might make bad choices. That, that wasn't my point. My point was someone has to be, someone has to have the incentive to develop the, right, the, the analytics library that doesn't actually send stuff to the server or that, right, it's, right. We haven't seen um, in, in the desktop, we haven't seen a lot of people go out and write privilege separation uh, because it's a very specialized context where you have to right, not trust part of your code and mm -hmm. you're willing to make things a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, I talked about four use cases. Only one of them requires privilege separation, and that's the jQuery case, where you include a library in a page as a script tag that has direct access to the DOM. It's not privilege separation in the conventional sense for the other use cases. So, so for the for the mint.com, right? Yeah. You have to have who's incentivized to to change the way mint.com works to create one that's that's different. So, so how's that going to take place? So, um, presumably, there could be a company or an open source developer who felt that there was demand from users to not give their login credentials to banks. And they would be motivated. Credentials are a red herring. They're not a red herring. They are a red herring because right, what's private is the information in the account. If, if Fidel OK, if fair enough. So login credentials and credit. the information in the account, fine, even better, yes. So the information in the account, they don't want to have a third party know the information in their account. Right. So a developer could decide that there's a market for this, that some users might prefer to use an application sure. that does not share the contents of their bank statements. And then they would write an application. Just like when, what was the market for Mint saying, oh, I bet people wanted to be able to look at this information in an integrated way. Now, you can say that you think that no users care. So, so the user is trusting, so, so they're basically, the, the party they're trusting to write the code, not to reveal the information in that case, is the code that gets access to the information. No, because the browser confines Mint's code. We wrote the browser. They're trusting us, not the people who wrote Mint. 
someone has to write the part that takes in the password and then doesn't reveal any information. No. No. Um, so you would log in to Chase the normal way in Chase's frame. Right. And then there would be a cookie in your browser, just like there always is. And then we would allow the cross-origin requests from Mint, but Mint is confined by our system. You did not type your password for Chase into Mint ever, and it does not have access to that password. Again, password is the... So Sorry, you, but I think you, you used the word password, so I'm replying to... You just said it has to get the password from somewhere, did you not? I was replying to that narrow point. Okay. Um, so mint. The, no, no, I, no, I understood that much, but, but then you're saying that, that the code, I, let's say, we'll call it mint 2.0. Yep. Mint 2.0 writes this, it then can go and do any requests for chase.com and get it back because it's. <clears throat> I think the point is that the user can expect the code of the page and see that what? I'm no. typing in no. the password. No, no, no. 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 If, you retrieve, if Mint retrieves data from Chase, it can't send it to anywhere. Right, sure. that's the point. But, but the question is, how is the user typing in the so password, right? Huh? Sorry? The user's typing in the password into a text box. Yeah, but that Mint. Mint. That that's well, Chase. Owned by Chase's day. That's yes. Chase. But it could be owned by Mint.com. The user what? only knows if they look at the source for that page and says, oh, this this box oh, actually is a usability in the frame argument. from Chase. Is this a usability argument you're making? No, I, I don't understand who's providing the API at Chase.com. When it's scraping, there's an API there. and But presumably, someone at Chase.com has to provide an API. Chase.com just sees that it's getting normal requests for downloading data to a browser because you can send the cross-origin request. So this is an XML HTTP request? Yes. OK. Sent by Mint. Sent by Mint, so you first have to, the, the user has to then go, go log into the. The user people. previously logged okay. in, yeah. Okay. Um, see, that, that actually is my usability word. Uh -huh. Right now, I just go to Mint. I type in one username and password. <laughs> Everything is at the back of the server. Fancy, it great. It's poetry in motion. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is. Otherwise, I wouldn't. If I had to uh, log into 16 different sites, Mint, by the way, today gives you an option. I don't know whether to trust. Do you it. ever log into your actual bank? What? Do you ever log into your bank? Yeah. You only, or you only log into Mint? No, I do both. Okay, so you're already logging no, into No, 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 but Mint, the, the idea, okay. So Mint today, I don't know how secure it is, offers you an option yeah. where they do not store your password, okay? Uh -huh. You have to basically go and type in whatever number of bank accounts and stock <coughs> accounts you have. You have to go type in every password separately each time you use Mint. Uh -huh. And from what I've heard, just based on Mint forums, nobody uses that option. Right. Right? And so... And so yeah. we're offering something easier than that. But, but you still want to type all 16 passwords each time, no? No. The cookies, that's the cookies, the cookies, cookies can be persistent. Security question, and it's like, you know, do you see your image and stuff like that. So like, even if it's cached. So you don't have a live session at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. So often you don't have to log out in the context of that, right? One of the things so that, that uh, Mint does for you is account alerts, and that's actually right. quite helpful. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So there's a constant server side presence. I see. So yes, it's true. Like, if the server sees that you, if Chase's server says that you don't have a fresh session, even if you have a cookie that's valid, yeah, yeah and then there'll you. be some I steps that you have to take. Yeah, that's right. right. I was want to ask a question about your it. argument about the users should be in charge of their model, their data, and uh -huh. of setting up their policies. So if, if that's the model, then the next thing I would think about is, you know, I'm in that comment or, or bats or sketchy.ru, which is going to basically say, pop up a window or something, that go pop up a window that says, you know, Sorry, if you really want to get access to your graph, you have to press this declassifying button because otherwise, you know, it's not working properly for you. Mm -hmm. And history so, has shown that a lot of users would click. Oh, that. They just click OK. Users love to click OK. Right. 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 Um, so why is that model the right model? In your mind? So the users are in charge of sort of. So users can make policies. mistakes. The system we we have not in our system. What we are doing is letting users whitelist, but then enforcing confinement on the code that gets the I sensitive see. data. I see. Right? So, so, it's, so users are partial. There's no, there's no button that lets you turn off mandatory access control when you click OK, okay. in our system. 
Thanks. So if you're worried about covert channels, no, 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 no. then maybe, yeah. Covert channels is a channel. Yeah. So users can only actually things, make things more restrictive, not less restrictive. No, they make things less restrictive in, in the following sense. They turn off the discretionary access control on Chase to let Chase's data be seen by the script from mint.com. Okay. Right? But then our browser makes sure that the code for mint.com is confined. I see. Okay. And there's no way the user can turn sorry, that sorry. off. Okay. How, but if you turn, if the user did this uh, in mint.com without telling mint.com, wouldn't mint.com's code get really confused? It's getting this response to a message that's got its label on it. The code doesn't understand about labels. It wasn't expecting to be confined. Um, no, just a moment. So your question is, when mint sends a message to Chase, is there a label on the message from mint? So no, no, no. So, in, there isn't. In, in this other scenario, the user says, oh, I'm not going to give my password to, to Mint, but I'm going to just go to, the, go to Cowl and say, just let Mint send things to Chase, and it'll end, right. use, use Mac to, right. to confine it. But in, in this scenario, wouldn't Mint send something to Chase? Chase would say, yeah, here's the data, and there's, and by the, and, but it's opaque until you, you know, do this, play this game where you lower your privilege uh, in order to read you it. You raise your label, yeah. You raise your label. Mint? Isn't Mint.com's code isn't going to know what to do with that. It's it, uh, the, if the user says if if, if Mint.com didn't change its uh, its code to deal with these these labeled messages. Well, Mint 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 has written its application to deal with labeled messages. Right. That is our. Oh, they they so know about Cal. Oh, they know about this. Cal and they write Mint to. Oh, I thought you had a new scenario where the user says, "Oh, for it, even if the even if the my code the code didn't decide to use Cal, I can." Make it use. No, 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 no. This is Mint plus plus. This Sorry? Is this is Mint 2.0. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. All right. The part, it's, it's what the banks, it's disabling the discretionary access control of the banks. The banks can be fully legacy. I see. Or maybe not if you're worried about the live session problem. But, um, right. Okay. I misunderstood. But. but usability, like, how do you assess the usability of this in a more. Graphic. Scientific way. Well, let's not even go that far. I mean, so here's one job thing. Scientific, less unscientific way. So here's one, uh, you know, troubling piece of news. I've been talking to my friends at Mozilla back and forth the last couple of months, and they say that they've been running scans to see how often CSP is getting used. Mm -hmm. And outside of the uh, extension model, which works in Chrome and Firefox, yeah, yeah. the same way, and CSP is uh, used very well and profitable and everything is great, it's actually not being used almost at all. Mm -hmm. And so then that begs, well, quite a whole number of questions. One of which is, well, is it because there are not enough good scenarios to use it, to mm -hmm. use it then, or is it because the usability is not entirely there, the developer, as I was pointing out earlier, is not sophisticated enough, you know, just doesn't come together. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's one thing to propose a mechanism, another thing to get it deployed on any sort Absolutely of correct. Scale. I don't so disagree. How, how would you even go about assessing the usability of this? Uh, so, by releasing it as open source and talking to web developers and, and trying to... How long? <laughs> <laughs> I guess what's what's the the that is what's this the most common like like thing that you have ever using this? <laughs> Password checker was one. <laughs> Mint is clearly far more complicated. jQuery, the, actually the privilege separated jQuery is the most complicated of them. So um, you wrote, wrote, that's what you wrote. Yeah, we've got it. Well, we, all, all four of those things we have running implementations of. Uh, but uh, the, that's good enough. No. No, come on. No. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's scientific. <laughs> yeah. no. We're not third floor Marxists. I mean, we'll go around with user studies and bowls of candy. <laughs> <laughs> There is something there, right, in terms of the level of complexity yes. the developer expects and the level of complexity one brings. And I'm not saying this exclusively about your proposal. I'm yeah. saying this about a whole number of proposals. A whole number of simpler proposals, yes. Come again? A whole number of simpler proposals is what you're saying. Uh, um, simpler or more complex depends on your point of view. But I think there is something, uh, you know, there's, there's a certain degree of mismatch because the same origin policy, you can hate it uh, or well, not hate it as much, but you know, it's kind of like one of those things you grow up with, right? As a developer. There's right? plenty of people who hate things they grew up with, but yeah. yeah I know, I know. Why not? Uh, and it seems like there's a bit of a cliff kind of thing after that, right? I mean, like, um, 
you know, so, so doesn't adoption is, is, is difficult. So I don't know. I'm not sure if you're, 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 do anything. you're assuming that developers understand the same origin policy? I'm assuming anything. <laughs> Just saying. Well, they understand when it makes their code not work. They keep okay. trying random things until it does work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly. a model of sorts. And I'm not sure that there is a debugging uh, sort of style approach to your proposal, for instance, mm -hmm. work the same way. And again, it's not the perfect outcome one gets you know, from this approach. Mm -hmm. It's something, right? Yeah. Like you, talk to, you talk to Brandon Ike, he'll tell you, right? So there was kind of a thing for mom and pop. You write the HTML, then you go a little bit of right. you know, get a little bit of functionality. You get animation. Right. And that's the way to go. Now, of course, you have things that are you know much more complicated, infinitely more complex yeah. than that. But the question is, well, can we use this? I think it's a good question. I, I do think that um, if you look at the example on the website, not that you would take the time necessarily. But if you did, you would see that the password strength checker is actually not that complicated yeah. at all. Like yeah. the source is quite simple. Yeah. So we spend a bunch of time talking about the privilege separated jQuery one. Mm -hmm. That's the hairy one. A lot of the use cases, just a second, for uh, third party libraries that have a narrow, well-defined API, yeah. that's the sweet spot for this, definitely. Um, which password checker do you use? Oh, we wrote around. 